thank you for having me. This is pretty exciting. And um, like we were just saying, it will be nice when we can meet in person, face to face instead of over Zoom. So as far as disclosures, I have no relevant financial interests to disclose. And I um, included uh, credits for the photos and various clip art things that I use throughout the presentation. If there are no credits, that means it's uh, my own photo. Uh, so I didn't forget. Um, I was asked to simply present some work and it made me very reflective, to be honest, about um, how did I get to where I am and what work would I want to present? So I thought that um, I would keep the objectives at the time of submission pretty general. And uh, while I still was mulling over exactly where to go with this topic. And um, so these are the topics I submitted, which are um, thinking about how we might um, develop and build, open up ourselves by building for opportunities. And I was thinking about that in relationship not just for faculty who might be present today, but also for learners, our trainees, um, because I think trainees are often surprised even after all the years that it took to, for them to get to where they are with how um, our careers still take these winding roads uh, to get to wherever we are at any one point in time. Uh, and also just to uh, talk about pragmatism, I think it's a pitfall in our field that sometimes we get ourselves really wound up over a lot of things. So I try to be very pragmatic and think, and today I hope to show you some things about um, just being practical in our approach to what we need to do. And then as Nibi has said, to talk about mindfulness for a little bit and maybe give you um, a little tweak to think about what you do for yourselves and how we deal with this at work and with the teams we're working with. So um, I don't think about myself as a classic scholar. I don't have any one subject matter that I've tried to explore for years and years. Um, I have been in a position to have a broad scope of responsibilities. So I um, thought about this for a while and I hope that you enjoy where we go with it. So I, first of all, I think there's, um, a little bit of uh, two parallel trains of thought here. One is what do I do? And one is how do I do it? So I am trained in both anatomic and clinical pathology. I worked uh, like Nibi has said at MedStar Washington Hospital Center. I was there for 16 years. And throughout that time I did um, transfusion medicine including uh, blood collection service and therapeutic apheresis. And I did a pretty uh, wide breadth of anatomic pathology. It began as GI pathology, but it always included some amount of frozen section coverage, autopsy coverage, a little bit of other clinical pathology coverage, um, and whatever was needed. So um, there's been a broad spectrum of work in pathology that I've done over time. And then the how do I do it is exactly what um, relates directly to the objectives, which is taking a very practical approach, what feels like to me to be common sense, but as many people who carry on about common sense say, it's really not that common. Um, and being really open to opportunities and having that um, scope of training and openness to what's going on and being a little gregarious I find has been helpful. And then what I like to call humanity at work. So we'll take off from there. And I thought I would just go back because um, I, I feel like in, even as early as high school and college, I was already developing an approach in this direction. I got a biology degree or chose to do that because it, simply because it was my favorite subject. I ended up after a while at Catholic University of America and I had, I really had no um, religious training growing up and my family is a mixture of a whole bunch of different religions. And uh, here I was at a school that required religious studies and I found out I just loved it. 
So I took a lot of religious studies classes. And then the other subject that I really, really loved was immunology. As I was coming to the end of college, I was thinking about, well, where do I go from here? What's going to come next? And I really spent about a year exploring that. I um, went about it by um, exploring some different options. So I thought, well, I like animals. Should I become a vet? So I worked for a summer at an animal sanctuary. I think I was not exactly overwhelmed with that experience in terms of a career option. So then I thought, well, what about research? And um, that seems like a good idea to give a try. And I stumbled into an, what began as an internship at the National Cancer Institute. Uh, that was a one semester um, program that um, ended in the middle of the school year. And so I had one semester left in school and I basically convinced them to hire me because um, I kept the lab in shape pretty well compared to the guy who was the, the lead investigator. <laughs> um, so I worked there and then, then of course the question was, do I wanna keep doing this? Do I wanna get a master's degree? Do I wanna get a PhD or um, do something in human medicine? And as you can tell, human medicine won the day. Um, and in part, it was a very practical decision and that's because Getting a PhD along there was a lot of time, and I simply wasn't sure that I could e either comfortably commit that amount of time or that I had a burning desire to study one particular subject for that long. I forgot to point out earlier, I did give each of these, how do I do it, its own font. So without focusing so much on that in each slide, you'll see the font change a little bit. That's not an error. On my part, that's just simply to point out that it goes along with a mode of thinking. Um, the research that project that I was involved in there was looking at um, various oncogenes, particularly KRAS and HRAS and um, a couple of others in um, relationship to ultraviolet light exposure in terms of what were the um, various uh, failures that occurred following ultralight exposure and how tumorigenic those were. So um, I think that this represents to me uh, at the beginning of a practical and learning-based exploration as, an, uh, as a basis for my decision-making. As I was heading into medicine, I really liked the scope of so-called general medicine, not getting too stuck down a long rabbit hole. I liked the idea of a hospital-based specialty because I didn't really know that they still form um, medical practice groups. I thought they were more of an employment situation and I didn't really savor the idea of having to run a practice. And um, I also thought after all I'd heard about um, physician schedules that it might be nice to have um, some form of a role that had um, either scheduled shifts or something else that would make the working hours a little bit more manageable. So I got to medical school. Uh, my favorite uh, subjects there early on were biochemistry and then just physiologic systems. Um, I also, as I went into my clinical rotations, every time I had to speak to a pathology resident, I thought they were the most impressive people. They knew so much about everything, um, including all the clinical aspects. And so they were really um, strong role models for me. And I, for, it brought to mind the idea that I could do an exploratory rotation. So that was that. I stuck with pathology. Um, it met all of the same initial criteria that I had initially, that it was very broad in scope within medicine. It was hospital-based and it was, had relatively manageable work hours. And one of the things I've really come to love about this field is the flexibility that we have in our schedule. Um, even as a resident, we had sign out every morning that began after the morning lecture, so nine o'clock every morning. And most of my fellow residents liked to stay late at night. So we would finish in the cutting room and then review all of our slides and come up with preliminary diagnoses for sign out at nine in the morning. And um, I found that didn't work as well for me as coming in early in the morning. And that's the kind of flexibility that I have just always really appreciated since that moment. 
Uh, and then in transfusion medicine and blood banking, it's an immunology rich field. So it was a uh, really great uh, way to get back to some of the things that I really loved. So emergency medicine went by the wayside. I think before, uh, without knowing it, I discovered the Deming Circle. So um, another reason to stay in pathology because uh, he's such a guru to our field. So coming out of training, I went to MedStar Washington Hospital Center. They are officially a community hospital, but um, they're huge. It's a 900 bed hospital. Um, and they have all sorts of training programs. It functions very much like an academic medical center and it certainly provides tertiary plus care. Um, there's a cancer center there, there's a trauma center, burn center, all sorts of very interesting subspecialties in um, cancer and surgical care in particular. It's also a cardiovascular center of excellence in the region. So we had a very broad scope of clinical activities, um, very close to the U.S. Capitol, just right up North Capitol Street. And um, when I first got there, it was just Washington Hospital Center. The MedStar Health System developed over time. And by the time I left, included about nine hospitals in the region. Uh, the anchored on the north side um, or in the Baltimore area on the south side, in the DC area and then also encompassing several hospitals in the surrounding suburbs and more rural regions. So this position included um, being one of two pathologists running this large transfusion service. We transfused about 50,000 units of blood components a year. We had a therapeutic apheresis service and an FDA licensed blood donor service. For those of you who, um, aren't in the nitty gritty of blood donor services, you can actually collect blood and transfuse it if you leave it on site. A lot of hospitals did that, particularly in the 80s and 90s when, when autologous blood donation was uh, very popular. Um, to be licensed means that you are um, inspected more rigorously by the FDA on a more regular schedule. And uh, you have to mind your P's and Q's a little bit differently. In, and in order to operate as a um, blood donor service in Washington, D.C., you almost have to be licensed because the uh, Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, believe it or not, you have to know these things when you work there, um, considers each and every building in D.C. basically to be its own entity. So if you wanted to move uh, your blood products that you collected from my hospital to another hospital in the city of DC, that would be uh, crossing state lines and an FDA license is, is required to move blood across state lines. So um, some of the intricacies of being in DC. In the FDA uh, rules themselves, it treats DC as a state, but then they have to um, acquiesce to that Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act so we did um, a lot of autologous blood collections. Uh, we did stem cell collections for a while and we did apheresis platelet collections. Um, just with this service and all of the related clinical services, there were a plethora of process improvement projects for us to do. At the same time, about every two years, and I don't know if this is the pace that you see in your setting, there would be a shift in what we're doing and how we're doing it in our department. Uh, so somebody would leave, retire, for example, we would hire a replacement person, go through a training period, we would rearrange some duties and this kept opening up new opportunities. After being there only about a year to a year and a half, I was asked to participate in a process improvement project and I felt a little, um, little uncertain when I started that project as to how such a thing would go because I had never done one on that scope. It related to canceling uh, lab orders when the patient was unavailable or, um, well, chronically unavailable, basically. 
And how did we do that? And it just touched on so many um, areas of the hospital, lots of things about communication and so on. It was really a pivotal learning experience for me and um, then opened up the door to a lot of other um, projects and leadership opportunities. So in terms of my own approach of being pragmatic, I definitely have this process improvement mindset. It's just um, part of my DNA, like we're doing okay, but we need to do better, or we get told we need to make a change, or we're asked to make a change. And so uh, I like to think about how can we do it? How do we meet the requirements? How do we make it streamlined? How do we make it easy to train and to do, um, which helps you to maintain how well you're doing it over time? I love flowcharts. Uh, I am often accused of being my father's daughter in that regard, but I just think they are such a good grounding tool with our teams to know what we want to do, how we need to do it, and even each time we open up a new conversation on the subject to get grounded with um, what part of this process are we talking about right now. Uh, I find that if we don't do that in our meetings, it's pretty easy for the conversation to jump all over the place. And before long, people are confused and lost. Now, I went looking for some clip art just to demonstrate a flow chart. And I have to say, I adore this one. It's um, not big enough that you can read it, but um, I did put the um, citation here if you want to go look it up. It's in French. And this is about asking your boss for a raise. And if you notice the prominence of the trash can in the lower center part, um, that was pretty eye-catching to begin with. But all of these different arrows relate to things like knock on your boss's door. Do they look up? Yes or no. Um, do they nod and welcome you into the room? Yes or no. Did you have fish for lunch? Does your boss tell you to come back at 2.30? Is it a Friday? Are they in a good mood? This is pretty amusing if you want to look it up. So I thought that um, following on from um, this blood transfusion and supply work and just taking a really practical approach, that we'd spend a few minutes talking about the blood supply and how we deal with that. Um, so blood does not grow on trees, and it's uh, something that our colleagues outside of the blood bank don't give a lot of appreciation for, to be honest. They really count on the blood supply being there as much as they want, whenever they want, without any particular notice or communication or planning. They're going to take somebody to surgery, and they're going to do what they're going to do, or they're going to embark on a treatment plan. Uh, and the patient will then be dependent on some blood products for some period of time. And they simply have the expectation it will be there. Um, it can't be made in a factory either. So it's not something we can manufacture to make sure it's there. And we also know from the literature that when blood donors are volunteers, the uh, safety of the blood supply is improved over when um, we pay them to be blood donors. So this is just an older review article um, demonstrating some of that that I noted here. Um, the last thing to note here is that this is also a major therapy. So this stuff, which is precious, it comes from other human beings and who have to volunteer their time. Um, it, it's really required therapy or part of the therapy plan, both as primary and supportive in so many treatments for uh, that we take for granted in modern medicine. So I think that we need to give it um, sometimes a little bit more respect. Of course, those of us in the field, this is what we do every day. And um, I feel so thankful to anybody who takes the time to be a blood donor to keep this going. So one of our first major challenges in the blood supply is simply having enough. I believe that uh, there is an educational component to this. Our general public really needs to know the need for uh, blood donations. Like why me, why now, how many people, what if my neighbor donates, why should I? And a lot of people have questions like that. So I think first of all, we definitely need to keep information out there in the public arena 
to um, keep people aware that the need is constant. We also are bringing a lot of focus um, lately to diversity in the blood supply. We have a great many patients who come from a great many um, heritage lines of background and our um, blood group antigens vary depending on that inheritance. So we usually talk about what's your blood type, ABO, um, and then either RH positive or negative. Well, when we get into the need for diversity, we're talking about lots of other so-called minor blood group antigens, and um, there's a lot of diversity out there. And so we need to match our donors to our patients, or at least to have sufficient donors so that patients who need those matches can get them. And um, this is, this is a, an important issue. Um, we are asking people to make their appointments and show up. We ask them to be qualified, and that means they have to answer close to 50 questions or so about their risks for both their own health, can they tolerate the blood donation, but also, and most of the questions focus on risks to the potential transfusion recipient. So they're pretty personal, uh, things about um, exposures through either medical treatments, illicit drug use, sexual activity, and so on. And people need to be willing to answer those questions and then of course have the right answers. They also need to get through the process despite most people not being especially fond of um, being stuck by a needle. They then need to come out on the other side of that donation with negative test results and they need to keep on coming back. We know that fewer than 5% of qualified adults in our country donate blood. So it would be really nice to move that needle up just a little bit. Our next major challenge is having this uh, inventory available at all times. So each of the products that we make from a whole blood donation or from an apheresis donation have their own um, outdate. Red blood cells are stored in a refrigerator up to 42 days. Plasma is most often frozen and can be kept for about a year. Liquid plasma, as you can see, is only 26 days. And the real issue that makes our life the hardest is platelets. We currently have a five-day expiration cycle on them. And the first day and a half is required to um, that these products are quarantined for purposes of testing. So during that time, the usual blood donor tests are done. But in addition to that, we have to hold the product for 24 hours collect a sample for culture, and, um, and then wait a while before we transfuse it after we get that culture going. So by the time any transfusion service receives a platelet product for the purpose of transfusion, uh, about a day and a half off that five days has already gone by. And, um, and they currently have the option to extend that to seven days. We're all uh, working toward implementation of some new platelet products and um, a new FDA guidance on this, which we can touch on a little later. But this is just a really rapid cycle. It's hard for everybody to keep up with this, both in the blood collection services and in the transfusion service. So we have to have a lot of platelets flowing through the system. Uh, blood donations slow dramatically throughout uh, these seasons of the year when large portions of the population go on vacation. In the pre-COVID world, about 60% of our blood collections, uh, and that's here locally at Bloodworks, but also pretty typical nationally, that half or more of blood donations occur at what are called mobile blood drives, where um, that's where you see the blood mobile bus or the blood collection team comes to an office building and sets up in a conference room, for example, for a day. Um, so when businesses are closed and schools are closed, uh, there's really no place for those mobile blood drives to happen. And so what we see is that blood donations and the blood inventory dip pretty significantly. As you can imagine, these are in big vacation seasons, like around the winter holidays and then the summertime. So it's not uncommon that uh, blood banks around the country 
suffer and do a lot of shipping um, and asking each other for support from each other during the, these timeframes. Conversely, when there's a community disaster, blood donations skyrocket. Uh, on 9-11, uh, there were lines around the block, I think, at every blood center in the country. Um, here in Seattle, we had the duck bus accident. This is since I've been here and the Amtrak derailment, which served as demonstration projects for the same kind of response. And although it's wonderful for people to come out and support the blood supply then, there are times when we don't need it all at once. We actually need those donations to be spread out over time. 9-11 was a great example of that. So we also need to have the right mix. So this is another challenge and it gets partly at that diversity que question that I mentioned earlier, but also simply gets down to the mismatch between patients and donors on simple levels like um, ABO blood group. So in that regard, um, about 44% of the population has blood group O and they can only get group O red blood cells for their transfusions. But because it's a universal donor blood type, we also use it for anybody who urgently needs blood before we know their blood type, which means we actually need more O red blood cells in the supply chain than our expected rate of group O patients. So we have a natural tension, which is just always present that we need to be attentive to. On occasion, there are patients who have special needs like those antigens that I mentioned before that need to be matched uh, for red blood cells. And then even less commonly than that, we need to provide uh, platelet units that are HLA matched to support patients who have become refractory to HLA mismatched platelet units. Another major challenge is that of course, accidents, traumas, OB hemorrhages and so on are not scheduled. So this supply always has to be there for whatever rolls through the door. Um, this is where planning for surgery actually is really important to us. And we endeavor to include our surgical teams as much as possible um, in planning any case where they expect to need a significant amount of transfusion support. And then uh, similarly, we strive to have good communications throughout the hospital uh, so that when there are shifts in the supply that would maybe make us um, think twice about beginning a certain therapy or taking a patient to surgery, that everybody has a way of knowing about that. And I think this is the last major challenge I'm gonna talk about today, which is that our standards change periodically. So FDA guidance is um, one of our major ways of having updates come to our field, particularly for blood donation standards. But we also have uh, professional organization accreditation, uh, whether that's AABB or CAP, those are the two most common. Uh, those standards get updated approximately every two years. So uh, the FDA uses this uh, terminology. It's a document they call guidance for industry. Um, they come on the FDA schedule. Of course, they don't consult my schedule or any other blood center schedule um, specifically about doing this. They come with a timeline uh, that for which the implementation is required. And some of these implementations require pretty major work involving uh, maybe bench level or frontline staff, but also of course, the procedures that they use, the, therefore there's training involved, the um, information systems that back up the work need to be changed, sometimes test methods need to be changed and so on. And for those of you who work in, in this field, you know that these changes, for instance, if you had to change a test method, that's not something that is quick or easy to do, especially if it involves finding a supplier, entering a contract, and then um, inspecting, assuring your supplier and uh, going through all of the validation simply to implement it. This is not something that's easy to do in a month or two months. And uh, the timeline that we often receive for these guidances is six months. So uh, that's what we're often working with. 2020 was an especially active year. Uh, the FDA made several updates to criteria, which 
they thought would help uh, support the blood supply during the COVID public health emergency. Uh, and they have suggested that those changes may not remain permanent once the public health emergency uh, goes away, which means all of the work we did to implement these last year could require either undoing or rework to revise um, whenever COVID um, fades from that level of um, public health emergency. So as you can imagine, this is a, just looking at this list, this alone is a lot of work to take, uh, to take on within one year and has nothing to do with all the rest of the work that we already had planned. So um, it keeps us busy. So meeting the challenges uh, involves working with um, blood donors and also implementing and carrying through with all of these standards. So for blood donors, we have to have strong community partnerships. We need to continue to bolster community education. We really need to have um, good availability of our donation sites and ours. And uh, as you can imagine, this requires huge flexibility from our staff. So if you can imagine um, a, for instance, an on-campus blood drive might not be happening during regular business hours. It might be in the evening or it might be on the weekend. And, um, and if you're going site to site on a frequent basis, then um, that might mean you have a different schedule and of course a different place to work several days of the week. And that takes a pretty big toll on staff. So we need to spend a lot of time also, um, like I said, updating all of these standards, which has a pretty standard process to it. We clarify what the standard's about. We review it and think through it. This is where your flow sheets come in handy. Um, determine our, the impact on all of our processes and um, make those changes. Um, so I will move on here. Also involved with um, blood donation is simply becoming a blood donor. And um, we know that the best recruitment tool is a personal request. So being asked by a friend or a family member is uh, the most effective tool for getting somebody to become a blood donor. And in this recent paper, um, social media was identified as the second most important tool. And FTD stands for first time donor, not flowers. Um, blood donors serve as role models. And that's part of the reason we think people are so receptive to that. And it's also a lifelong commitment for many people. And um, that's part of the way that they function as role models. Uh, people who schedule routinely, uh, we find that helps a lot to keep people coming back. Um, donors also do love their goodies. And we have a program which is actually available in a number of blood centers. It began in Oklahoma and they've licensed this um, name. It's called Thank the Donor. It's really interesting, uh, but it basically it gives a website to which a patient or a loved one of the patient who's in the room at the time of transfusion can uh, simply submit a comment thanking the donor um, by using the unit number. They can peel a sticker off of the unit and submit that unit number and uh, send a message of gratitude if they so choose. Uh, they can select who can see that, whether it's just the donor, the blood center, whether it can be used in social media postings, et cetera. And uh, the comments are curated. They don't go directly through. Uh, so to assure there's no personal identifying information and such. Um, for a lot of blood donors, that's a very heartwarming um, and um, it's a heartwarming experience that makes them feel compelled to keep on as a blood donor because they know the personal impact that they're having. On being qualified, I'd just like to come back to this. I had mentioned those 50 questions or so that people get asked. And these are some of the things that just changed last year that are pretty big, um, have pretty big impacts on the blood supply. So uh, this is just an example of uh, a map from the what's called the CDC Yellow Book. And it just defines areas where malaria is endemic and that affects qualification as a blood donor. Uh, exposure history, family history of Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease or variant CJD are also um, 
concerns for qualifications and blood donors. And those criteria were updated last year. Just to give you a sense of that, when those CJD uh, related requirements went into place quite a while ago now, um, they were expected to result in a loss of blood donors by about 3%. And they had at least that effect. Um, I was still in DC when that happened and it's a very cosmopolitan population there with a lot of world travelers, as you can imagine with all the people in government. Uh, so we saw more like a five to 6% hit to our blood, uh, blood donor qualification based on um, rules that excluded people who had spent a certain amount of time in England, uh, the British Isles, Great Britain, that's what they called it, and um, the rest of Europe, uh, just around those criteria alone. HIV, uh, the big issue in HIV updates is um, one of our other socially sensitive topics aside from simply trying to obtain uh, blood donations from a wide breadth of diverse blood donor populations. Um, this touches also on a hot button topic, which is allowing, uh, or what are the criteria by which we allow men who have sex with men uh, to donate blood? Um, this is also applies to women who have sex with men who have sex with men. So um, the question as currently stated on the donor history questionnaire asks uh, men if they have been involved in this activity and females about their sexual activity. Um, there's a lot of push right now to minimize or eliminate this deferral criterion and to not make it about being men who have sex with men, but make it something much more specific to either their specific sexual act, in which case it doesn't matter if you're male or female, or some other specific risk, whether that's number of sexual partners, number of sexual partners over some period of time, or so on. So this is a pretty socially sensitive question, and we do get um, pretty regular input from community organizations asking us to work on making sure that the science is there. Uh, HIV deferral criteria for blood donors in this country have now been updated twice in recent years, but for from the mid 80s until just a few years ago, it, the result of uh, for a male having had sex with a male was permanent blood donor deferral, which they certainly didn't feel was appropriate anymore. Um, similar issues uh, came up around uh, the tests and recent history of syphilis. After a blood donor donates, um, part of the process is to have their specimens tested and um, they have to make it through these tests. And sometimes this can be pretty confusing because um, the result from a blood center isn't always the same as what you hear from your doctor's office. And an example would be um, HIV testing where a physician might take a set of results and be able to say confidently to their patient, you're HIV negative. At the blood center, we say, yep, you're HIV negative, but you still can't donate blood. We have a reentry option for you, but that requires waiting some period of time, going through retesting and so on, which is cumbersome to donors. Donor deferral can be temporary, indefinite, or permanent. So um, this creates a bit of a hassle for donors as well. Indefinite means permanent unless the rules change. So uh, that's the difference between those two words. I see the time is slipping by, so I'm just gonna step it up here a little bit. Uh, blood donor anemia is another hot topic. Um, so we have to mind our iron in our blood donors and um, this can be hard to do. It depends, it's an issue before donation and of course after donation, particularly for people who donate regularly. So just to mention quickly a little bit about what's happened since COVID and um, Dr. Bragano uh, and I teamed up to um, publish something about the effect that we saw here in, in the blood supply and transfusion world uh, last year, which is basically the same pattern that other communities came to have. We just happened to be first. So first there's a fear um, response and people didn't wanna come out of their houses. So the blood donations got canceled and the blood supply vanished. Um, we made a rapid community appeal 
And since then, people have been willing to come back in. Um, right now, the issue is that medical care has resumed at over 100% of baseline. Uh, so we are always um, basically having to raise our threshold of what's baseline. As you can imagine, because it was a public health emergency, the FDA allowed some alternative changes. Uh, we had donor criteria for exposure and recovery to COVID. We implemented social distancing where um, those mobile blood drives all became what we call um, pop-up blood drives, which are short-term uh, fixed sites. And we went to an appointment only model so that people we knew exactly how many people would be present and we allowed the space just for that many people. So you couldn't bring your friends with you and just have them wait in the lobby, for example. We also began collecting COVID convalescent plasma that we call CCP. Uh, so we have issued this to all regional hospitals, regardless of their uh, customer status, uh, whether they get their blood supplied by us usually or not and um, over a broader region than our typical blood customers um, for patient use. And we've also contributed both to national study protocols and to the so-called national stockpile, where we now anticipate many of these units will be used to um, manufacture concentrated immunoglobulins. So um, along the way for all of this day-to-day -day work, when something comes up that is worth sharing or particularly interesting, I've tried to contribute and work with my colleagues in various departments to share some things into the literature. And like I just mentioned, um, Dr. Pagano having reached out last year, and that was a, a fun experience to report both our COVID experience um, on paper, but also in an AABB um, seminar where we could interact with our blood bank colleagues around the country. These are some of the other topics that I've worked on over the years. Um, interestingly, I actually have not written a lot about TTP, but have uh, worked with a vast number of TTP patients, which it took me some years to realize how much more TTP I was seeing than most people in the country. And that had something to do with being um, in the geographic region of the Mid-Atlantic and having a large African-American population where this disease is more common than in the Caucasian population. Some other ways that I've been involved with um, sharing or education have been through more formalized venues. For a little while, I was a residency program director. Um, that hospital in DC had a residency program that was um, struggling after some years of neglect, I guess I could say. Um, so that was a bit challenging, um, but it did spur me on to think about it a little bit more formal way. I um, was able to take the Medical Education Research Certificate or Merck course, which was a year long course in the conduct of research specifically around medical education. I did a pilot project based on problem-based learning and improvement. And I've also worked with um, residents, fellows, medical students, and other types of students throughout my career. And one of the things that I have uh, enjoyed quite a bit is the Northwest Transfusion Symposium that we've put on um, through Bloodworks. We had purposefully decided um, to not present one in 2020 for a variety of other reasons before COVID happened. And then in the setting of COVID that really sealed our fate. So we're, we have to go back to the drawing board and think about when we might be able to do, do our next transfusion symposium. Um, like I mentioned, my Merck project was around patient uh, practice-based learning and improvement, which is one of the uh, core competencies in graduate medical education. And um, I'm not going to get into it much right now just because I want to preserve some time for questions and so on, but it was a small pilot study um, about helping people understand uh, something about PBLI that was went beyond uh, simply doing case studies as a way to reflect on one's learning. 
I do want to spend a couple of minutes talking about humanity at work. And this is a phrase that I started using when I noticed um, people would stop by my office because I had an upholstered armchair and a nice floor lamp. And people would ask if they could simply come in and sit in my nice chair and close their eyes for a minute, take a deep breath before they got on with their day. They just found it to be a really inviting atmosphere and uh, they enjoyed a little bit of nice uh, conversation. And um, so I just really started to think about this as having some humanity at work that we are not automatons who go straight through for eight plus hours a day um, doing stuff to be productive for our hospital. Um, it's also highlighted the lesson to me that people do deal with difficult people in the course of their day. And so they really appreciate um, when you're not difficult, if you're just pleasant to work with and um, mind some basic manners, people can be very appreciative. And I think if you think about your, your own experience at work, it's certainly a whole lot nicer <laughs> to work with somebody who is um, being nice than with somebody who's having a temper tantrum. And in pathology, I think we experience a lot of people having temper tantrums. Uh, they see us as a service department to give them what they want when they want it. And um, it doesn't always work that way. We, we have a role to play that takes time also. So um, I also have a friend who was an executive assistant and she used to say, you know, all it takes is saying hello before you start asking. Sometimes the doctors walk in the room and just start demanding things. Why don't we just start by saying good morning? And um, I think that's a really valuable lesson. I also think it, it's reasonable to um, be doing the best you can and, and be honest about that, that you know it might not get done today because you've got this or that going on. Um, and it's nice to be supportive to other people, foster their gr growth, include them in problem solving, being clear and honest with them. It's always nice when you bring treats and of course, say thank you when you're done. And I love this little photo micrograph. This is a bronchial and just happened to be squished into a heart shape in this particular field. And then when it comes time to doing all of this work and then having the rest of our lives, I think we all have to ask ourselves a lot of times or we feel like there might not be enough hours in the day. So I think about this as being um, bringing that humanity for ourselves, not just to everybody else. We need to prioritize, we need to think about our own needs and what our limits are. And for myself, um, I joke, like I've been thinking about this for over 20 years. I still don't quite have it right for more than a couple of weeks at a time. So I think that just, we are always figuring it out. And that's one of the things that maybe we need to accept, at least I do. Um, I've also been privileged, really privileged to participate in uh, a course on mindfulness-based stress reduction. That's what that course was called. It was offered through the Georgetown University Medical School. And um, my connection there is that uh, that hospital was just a couple of miles away from ours and they both became um, parts of the MedStar system. So, um, their, the training course was a, with a small group of people, two co-leaders and 10 participants. It was held at a rural conference center. It was um, almost like a bed and breakfast. It was very intimate and very intense. Uh, we took every single session and technique taught in what would normally be a 12 week uh, lineup in the course of four days. And so you can imagine how much um, we got to know each other through that and how much introspection uh, we had to do. Uh, our payback for taking the course was that we then had to pay it forward and be a co-leader in groups back on campus. And um, to me at the time, it, it did introduce me to some techniques that I had not used or refined my use of some of them. Um, but mostly it brought organization to what um, I've been referred to by some people as a little bit hippy dippy or what I would call before that my little new age spirituality self after all that religious um, training and, um, and being a modern person. 
So coming to Seattle has been just such a wonderful change for me. Um, like I said, I was doing all sorts of everything in pathology. The group started changing in ways that for the first time I could really clearly identify those were just not changes I was going to be on board with. Uh, so knowing that um, transfusion medicine is what I really wanted to do or would do if I could, but it's such a small specialty um, focus that I would be open to a number of types of opportunities. I lucked into this position here, which turned out to be a super huge adventure. It involved starting a transfusion service from scratch within the pre-existing Bloodworks framework. Um, instead of being um, virtually on my own, back in DC, we had two blood bank pathologists and one of them left our group, which left me with me, um, which is not a very dynamic uh, collegial exchange. <laughs> Uh, so this really represented a, a beautiful opportunity uh, to work with people and to bring things forward. And um, one of the things that Teresa and Esther and I um, have found that we really resonate together around is our attention to our mindfulness and um, so-called humanity at work. And we began to develop this as a tool in our staff meetings. And um, it just remains uh, and has become, I think, a really precious little moment. Those staff meetings happen on late Thursday afternoon. And so we're pretty tired. We're all pretty, pretty close to the end of the week. And it's a really nice chance to just take a moment. So returning to the objectives, this is just their remix after um, thinking through all of these different topics that Opportunities taken, open doors for more opportunities. I know that may sound like just a platitude, but I feel like every step of the way for me at least has um, depended on willingness and openness. And each time I've said yes, there's been some way to grow from that. Um, also that uh, it's important to get the job done and to do it well, but not make it too complicated like that French flow chart. And it's really important to take care of yourself in ways that are important to you and to help others do that. Um, even just feeling that support from your colleagues, which can feel a little awkward in the workplace. I think we're not used to uh, really fully allowing ourselves to let down in this environment. Um, but to feel that support and to offer it to others is, is really special. And simply be nice. So I thought we might end up here um, having a little mindful moment. I just learned this particular exercise myself in the fall and it's called two feet and a breath. And it's wonderful and is proposed particularly for people who have busy jobs on the go and physicians as one of those types of people. The thought is, and you know, Sit up straight and feel free to close your eyes. Plant your feet flat on the ground and simply take a deep breath and notice your feet. Feel how they are on the ground, if they're hot or itchy or your shoes are tight or you're on Zoom at home and you're not even wearing shoes. Just to take that deep breath and notice your feet. which just takes that long and can really reset you for your next task or getting on with your day. So I'm gonna stop there and um, we'll see about any questions or discussion anybody would like to, to bring forward. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Dr. Alcorn. That was wonderful. Just trying to see if there's any questions in the Q&A. So I don't see any quite yet. I think everybody is relaxed after that mindfulness moment. <laughs> Let's hope, right? <laughs> Let's see. So, so Hamilton Zang is asking, do you miss not signing out AP? 
No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually, uh, maybe I'm a little, another way in which I'm a strange bird is that uh, I, I found autopsies, I think, maybe more fascinating than day-to-day -day AP. I know they're not... Um, great in terms of financial compensation and they take tons of time and I was as late as anybody on signing out my cases but they're just fascinating uh, to see how we are inside. Okay we have more questions coming in so Monica Pagan is asking I would like to know your opinion about paid donations and whether you think it can affect volunteer donors, donators. Yeah, so there's a, a very recent article about the potential utility of having paid blood donors, and I, I think I have not formed a strong opinion about it yet. Um, there, it would seem there would need to be some form of uh, funding for it because blood centers in general don't really have any money to spare. Every blood center is um, functioning on a very fine line of financial stability. So in order to be able to do that, we'd have to look at it pretty carefully. Uh, we do have the concept of the pedigreed donor, and those are donors we use for things like these specially matched platelets um, donations or for granulocyte donations. A pedigreed donor is somebody who's been through the donation process and all of the testing twice within a six month period. So that if we called them up and said, hey, can you come donate tomorrow? We would feel pretty good that they're not suddenly going to be positive for hepatitis or syphilis or any of the other tests that we test for. So um, I would think that might be one way to go if we were going to start paying donors. Yeah, and there is another question kind of at the same time related that also um, asking about that they've noticed that Blood Ricks is offering a small dollar uh, amount donation to blood donors and um, they're curious about how that fits in with kind of that volunteer donation that I guess we're talking about. I'm not sure what you're referring to around the dollar amount other than that we have various giveaways and such. And the FDA is pretty clear that um, you can offer so-called treats. Um, some people do use the word incentive, but the idea is that they're not supposed to be um, particularly financially viable incentives, and that you should apply them to everybody who presents to donate, not to people who, not only to people who make successful donations. That way you do not provide an incentive for people to be dishonest during the donor history questionnaire screening phase. You know, if they if they want the t-shirt you're giving away that badly, they'll they'll say, no, I never injected drugs and did that or the other thing. And um, so we don't want to incentivize people in that way. Um, and the dollar value has to be low so that it's not, um, there's no incentive for somebody to get the item just so they can sell it for its cash value. So what you see is a lot of blood donor centers give away things like t-shirts or um, raffle entries. And I know we do that a fair amount at Bloodworks. So every donor gets a, an entry into a raffle for something. And that something changes from time to time. Yeah, and I guess we didn't really touch on um, the new platelet products, but do you foresee kind of um, any shortages with that? I know we, we did mention that there's a, platelets are our pain point always. And then how do we help mitigate that, I guess, going forward? Yeah, well, we've, um, we've done a lot of work to develop forecasting tools for around use and days of the week. And we update those numbers periodically to see. So we know what our typical daily use is. Um, and like I said, it varies each day of the week. So we have different targets in our collection for each day. And in terms of making those new products, we did build into uh, our forecast exactly how many collections we need to make in order to meet those targets. So for example, pathogen reduced platelets have uh, more volume loss uh, between the collection and the final product. 
So you need to collect more in order to end up with the same amount, the final product. And we have built that in to our collection planning. Makes sense. And then there's another attendee noted how about offering mindfulness training while people are donating blood? Oh, sounds good to me. <laughs> we could play um, guided meditations over the over the um, speakers and such. <laughs> a lot of people uh, do like to come in, especially apheresis donors, and they like that time as a time away from their desk to either chill out or to um, to do some reading or paperwork um, that they would otherwise find hard to get to. Great. Um, and I don't see any more uh, questions. I do think we are pretty much at time. Dr. Hess is thanking you for gathering new products for group A low titer, anti-B plasma and low titer O whole blood. Well, thank you. It's always a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Alcor. It's been great. Really appreciate what you do. Thank you so much. I hope you have a, a wonderful afternoon.